So, you know those movies where if you're channel surfing and you come across any one of these that you can't look away. So I'm talking about, of course, Animal House, Step Brothers, 16 Candles, Gladiator, Point Break, arguably the greatest movie ever made, and of course, Tommy Boy. So you remember this scene in Tommy Boy where the hood flips up and they barely avert disaster. On my third deployment, when I was in VF-143, our sister squadron, VF-142, kind of did a Tommy boy. We had just pulled out of port in Dubai, and in those days, Dubai was a mere shadow of what it is today. In fact, there was only one major hotel back in 1991. It was the Hilton, and they had a beach club that was a lot of fun, so we'd have an admin at the Hilton, then jump on the bus and go to the beach club. And they had a fantastic spread down there where they did shish kebabs and they had a little par three course. And I remember Nuke Nectarline got a hole in one and all he would give you was a pitching wedge and a putter. So it was pretty good liberty by early 90s Mideast port call standards. So we pulled back out to sea and the first day we were back out to sea, we did a bunch of post-maintenance check flights. So the first event was only a six plane event and all the planes on that cycle were doing post maintenance check flights. So I was airborne in a VF-143 puking dogs F-14B with Spaz Geyer. We were doing a PMCFA, which means the engines were changed during the maintenance and it includes a supersonic dash. So we got our flight done and when we came back to the ship and switched up tower frequency, we heard that something was amiss. So one of the sister squadron airplanes, the Ghost Riders, call sign Dakota, had had a major problem during their post-maintenance check flight. The crew was Reb Edwards and Grundy Grunmeyer, both lieutenant commanders on their second and third tours in fighter squadrons, so relatively senior crew. So they were doing a supersonic dash with G on the airplane, and the ray dome came unlatched and swiveled at the hinge and hit the canopy, completely destroying the plexiglass in the pilot's cockpit. But let me let the pilot, Reb Edwards, tell the story in his own words. We were airborne for a post-maintenance check flight at Charlie, which was the least complex of the PNCFs, as you and I called them back in the day. And uh, we, had actually, we had had a change to our flight control system, uh, the part replaced our flight control system. Uh, but we had two airplanes up that day. Is there were actually only six aircraft airborne on that cycle. And it was all a post-maintenance check flights. Nice sunny day in the uh, northern Arabian Gulf. And uh, we're, uh, we had another airplane that was airborne flown by a skipper, Dick Gallagher, call sign Weasel. And Weasel was on a pro Charlie, or on a pro Bravo actually so he needed to do a supersonic dash so we figured we'd get a a little uh, tactical time and check some lights in our training matrix after we had completed our primary mission so he started a supersonic dash into the boat at altitude you know about 1.3 1.5 or so and we flew away, away from the ship to intercept him to get a supersonic intercept and then do a quick acm engagement and come back to the boat and we'll have as soon as we started our re-attack i put g on the aircraft uh nose low and a right hand turn and at that point everything changed there was an explosion. I um, immediately was unable to see very well out of either eye. And as I looked around me, I saw that the glass in the canopy was missing. And all of uh, the three windscreens in front of the pilot's seat were so crazed and cracked that you couldn't see 
out of the airplane when you're looking to the front. So at that point, we had no idea what happened to Weasel and his airplane. Um, and in fact, he had no idea what happened to us. So we were going about 600 miles per hour over the ground at about 28,000 feet. And the, the canopy imploded as far as I knew. Well, I thought the explosion was explosive decompression because the rest of the airplane seemed to be in pretty decent shape. And we immediately began to spiral down in a tight spiral, dropping down to about 225 knots as quickly as I could to get ourselves to about 10,000 feet, get ourselves in thicker air. We got down to 10,000 feet, which you'll recall is the, the height at which we would generally do controllability checks for an airplane if it was having some sort of problems with the flight control surfaces. And uh, I leveled out at about 250 knots, level at uh, 10,000 feet, and uh, took stock of what we had. I had a rudder authority light. I couldn't see out the front of the airplane because of the damage to the windscreen, and I had no canopy around me. And I, I took a, another look. There was glass all over the cockpit and blood and, you know, a little bit of guts. And and then I noticed that, in fact, I didn't um, even have a uh, oxygen mask hose attached to the plastic, hard plastic fitting on my face, you know, that comprised that part of the oxygen mask. The impact of whatever we hit, it, it was actually was the radome. Um, but I didn't know at the time because you can't see the radome from the pilot seat when you're in the air. So we had not only undergone explosive decompression, we didn't have any oxygen while we were at altitude and spiraling down, but we had a lot of adrenaline. I looked in the rear view mirror, the center rear view mirror uh, on the windscreen had left the airplane. That's at the bottom of the Persian Gulf somewhere. And Grundy, Scott Grunmeyer, one of my Naval Academy classmates, and we had flown my first squadron together in one of the great Rios that I had the opportunity to fly with in the Navy, was slumped down in his seat and wasn't moving. So we were about 35 miles from the ship. I had made, made a mayday call when this all happened. Um, I now realized, actually I made two, I realized that those mayday calls did not go out because when I lost the when the hose became disconnected from the hard plastic of oxygen mask, the communications fittings, the wires disconnected as well. And I knew I was in pretty poor physical shape. I uh, looked in the uh, mirror up on the run screen, the right mirror, and my face was all cut up, bruised and swelling. Uh, my right eye was glassed over and just white, uh, like uh, the eye of a dead dog, you know. And I had glass in my left eye, and I realized I was blind in my right eye. So I was pretty sure at that point I was never going to fly again, much less fly Navy airplanes again. And then I realized that I had some physical damage to my torso. My right arm was quite sore, and I could feel the swelling, uh, swelling my right near my right collarbone, which sat just below where the coat fittings were, you know, for our parachutes. So that was quite comfortable to have, you know, my body begin to press against that over on that side. In fact, I had a, a bruise on a quarter of my chest. I was almost a, a, a uh, square for six weeks. You know, it was black. Anyway, so I had some broken bones. I was blind in one eye. And I had an airplane that had some damage to it that I didn't quite understand. I didn't have a good airspeed indicator. Didn't have a very good altimeter either, actually. And the angle attack indicator had an off flag. So I had no uh, easy way to determine the speed at which the aircraft was flying. And the, the airspeed indicator became more erratic as I slowed down. So still couldn't talk to Grundy, obviously. Couldn't talk to the ship. But I flew back to the ship, and I realized I needed to land immediately. But at first, I needed to make sure the airplane was controllable. So what I did is I flew a qualitative evaluation, if those are in air quotes, qualitative evaluation on the airplane as if uh, it was a technique that I learned at test pilot school, that everyone learns at test pilot school, to take an unfamiliar airplane and test it for a mission and determine its suitability to perform that mission. And I, the mission that I, I, I did a quick test flight for was, is this air, will this airplane be able to fly well enough to get it on the boat? Can I fly it in configuration powered approach? So I dropped the gear, dropped the flaps. Engage the DLC, put the speed brakes out, you know, all the things they usually do. And I was astonished that all of those systems actually worked. And I, I did some turns, I did some climbs, I did some descents, 
I sort of practice approach up at altitude, you know, and then a wave off. Um, and then, you know, went back to 10,000 feet and, uh, and I found that, uh, you know, I thought if I could get on the deck pretty quickly because I was pretty sure that I was in shock and going deeper in shock, but I had thought that a limited amount of time to get the airplane back on the boat safely, but I was going to have to do it without the ability to either talk to the ship to tell them that I was coming home nor the ability to have the uh, to hear the LSOs or talk to the LSOs and talk about the condition of the aircraft. Well, as it turned out, when they took one look at the airplane, when I flew up the left side at flight deck level, remember, if you needed to land immediately and you were uh, Nordo, you had no communications, you flew up the left side of the ship, gear down, flaps down, hook down, and you moved the throttles back and forth. Well, I, I was hope they got the message because it was going to be an off-cycle recovery. I had no idea that they could just look at the airplane and see the radar missing and have a pretty good idea that these guys wanted to land immediately. So um, I started a downwind turn, and uh, as I uh, looked back over my left shoulder, which wasn't easy to do as my right shoulder was swelling against the uh, coke fitting, they had already moved the yellow gear out of the uh, landing area, so I knew that... um, that they were at least thinking about giving me the opportunity to land. Bill Cross, the captain of the ship, was giving me the opportunity, thinking about letting me land the aircraft. The ship was headed downwind, and as you recall, it takes 10 minutes generally for the ship to turn into the wind. He immediately started to turn, and I had 10 minutes. And in that 10 minutes, I did two practice approaches. And uh, they were straight ends, and they were just, they were case three approaches like you and I had flown, you know, hundreds of times. I turned downwind, you know, I had, uh, I still had range on my tack end, and I turned in, you know, at three miles like we'd always do. I lined up. I flew an approach down to 200 feet. I looked for the wave-off lights. I got the wave-off lights. I cobbed the power, climbed back up to 1,200 feet, you know, and came back around for another pass. What I found is that I thought I could land the aircraft. Of course, I couldn't see the landing area out of the front of the aircraft, but using a combination of the instrument landing system, the automatic carrier landing system needles, and the guys in air ops, Chuck Buker ran air ops, as you recall. He was real heads up Rio. And although it was daytime, he turned those systems on, you know, which are generally used for night. And that was a great help to me to line myself up when I, you know, when I couldn't see the ship at a distance. And then as I get in close, I found that I could close my right eye and hang out the left side of the airplane into the bre- in the breeze. And, and I thought I could fly the ball that way and get the aircraft on deck safely. So. I came around uh, for that third pass, and as I rolled out, there was no yellow gear in the uh, wires, and as I rolled wings level and centered the stick, the lens came on, so I knew they were going to give us a shot. The BRC, the base recovery course, was 3-2-2, and uh, Bill Cross had taught his officer of the deck to, to vary the the speed of the screws on the left and right side of the ship to dampen the Dutch roll in, in a Nimitz class boat. And that, that uh, aircraft carrier did not veer off of uh, 322 degrees, you know, more than a tenth of a degree all the way down. And all I did at that point was, you know, with my new modified procedures flying the aircraft as I flew, it, flew the, the uh, airplane all the way down, just like we've been trained to do, until I was sure that I was over the deck. And at that point, you remember the term spotting the deck, you know, what you're not supposed to do. At that point, I spotted the deck, but ended up uh, trapping relatively on speed, but on glide slope and catching the three wire. Spaz and I watched Reb and Grundy come aboard from a thousand feet overhead the ship in low holding. And from that vantage point, I don't want to say it looked like a normal pass, but it didn't look that hairy. Those guys were in the landing area for a little while as they hooked up a tractor and pulled him out, sidelined him, and finally we were able to come out of low holding. Um, the Airbus said, okay, everybody else, Charlie, Spaz and I come into the break, go through our landing checks, hook down, wheels down, flaps down, DLC engaged, harness locked, Spaz flies, flies a beautiful pass. We roll out after catching the wire and we look over and we saw this and we both went oh my god how did reb land this airplane amazing airmanship 
and professionalism by Reb. You could hear his thought pattern in his relating of the incident. He's a very calm guy, very matter of fact, very analytical test pilot, which helped him a lot. Also, what you heard him tee up there was a lot of coordination. So what he didn't say in great detail was Grundy, he says he slumped over, but Grundy was actually trying to stay out of the wind blast and hunkering down so he could communicate. His intercom and radio was working, so he was talking to various agencies, but only when they were within three miles from the ship. He couldn't communicate for some reason when they were outside of three miles from the ship. Reb mentioned Captain Cross, Tomcat guy, later Admiral Cross, who was the battle group commander during my department head tour aboard America. Um, fantastic Tomcat pilot, also a test pilot, school graduate. So he, met, he mentioned how he had his officers of the deck vary the screws so the Ike wouldn't Dutch roll and would really keep a nice BRC. The air ops officer turning on the needles, great heads up. So fantastic crew coordination, fantastic coordination with the agencies on the ship led to a great outcome. So the other thing you don't see is, and I was able to watch this once I got aboard, when they replayed the Platt presentation. So what you see is Reb is on and on because he's flying needles. And like he mentioned, once he started spotting the deck, the airplane comes pretty dramatically to the left. So in this picture where he's over the wires, you can see he's lined up pretty far left. But again, miraculous approach, post-mortem. What they discovered in terms of why the ray dome came unhinged was the latching mechanism. So basically it's a handle that translates like this and lines up with the cutout under the ray dome and you push it flush. And when you close it, it pushes these two feet, one in the fuselage, one in the ray dome. It wasn't closing and so the maintainers forced it shut and in the process they broke it to the degree that under a lot of G it came unhinged. Reb and Grundy received distinguished flying crosses for their performance, highly deserved, and Reb went on to be a NASA astronaut who flew one shuttle mission, an eight-day mission to dock with Mir. So that'll do it for this episode. Before I go, let me mention a couple of things. Bio sent me his latest effort, Tomcat Rio. I'm very much enjoying this book. A lot of detail that Bio goes into. So if you read Top Gun Days, this is sort of the second half of Bio's career, including his time as CEO of VF24. So check it out. Speaking of books, Punk's War is still on sale. And it will be for the entire month of May, as long as the inventory holds out. So I just heard from the press this morning. They said they're down to about 60 some books because of the way you guys have been buying it. So thanks for that. But if you haven't got your copy yet at the deep discount of 90%, get it before too long. Do not wait. Because once they're out, they'll do a reprinting, but it's going to take a few weeks, and that may extend beyond the month of May, and then it'll go back to the regular price of $19.99. So get your copy today. Also, I need your help getting this channel to the next level. So please become a patron at my Patreon page, patreon.com slash Ward Carroll. There are benefits of being a patron. The Mooch Newsletter, The Mooch Report, special podcasts. We'll do Zoom town halls, very intimate with just the patrons and other things. But more than anything else, your support will ensure that we're able to bring more episodes and the highest quality production values. So for those who've already become patrons, thank you very much. 
And for everybody else, I would very much appreciate it if you would become a patron. Again, it's patreon.com slash Ward Carroll. All right. That'll do it for this episode. As always, please subscribe. If you're a first-time viewer, ring the bell. And give me a like. Likes matter a lot in terms of visibility of each episode. Comments. The comments are awesome. You guys are fantastic. I am loving this community. It really does my heart good to hear from each and every one of you. And as you've seen, I try to answer every one. And share the episodes on the other social channels that you are part of. And I look forward to talking to you again soon.